All right, we're going to get started. Can everyone hear me okay? Oh, all right. Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, I'm Hannah Benbo. I'm the cartoons librarian at the National Library. Um, so it's my absolute pleasure to have you, so many of you here, to, um, to hear us talk about some really interesting New Zealand comics. Um, I really wanted to have a conversation about uh, what is it? What does it mean to make a New Zealand comic? Um, what, you know, what's good, what's bad, what's missing, all that kind of stuff. So we've assembled some of my favourite artists and one of my favourite writers. Um, and we're just going to have a bit of a chat about their work and their thoughts on things. Um, someone's already said to me that they think they should be on this panel. So as soon as they, <laughs> you know, there are just so many talented people out there and we're not going to have everyone, but we're going to leave a little bit of time at the end for questions and comments and a bit of a discussion. So I hope everyone kind of feels represented and involved. Um, falls to me to do the health and safety. Um, so in the event of an emergency, there's an earthquake. You're in one of the safest buildings in the country. There's nothing to get under. So... Just like an aeroplane, you want to brace yourself, um, adopt the brace position, and wait for advice from staff. If you hear a siren, you want to go up the stairs and out the back, and we gather uh, outside Rugby House. Yeah, so out Aitken Street, Rugby House. Um, is that all the health and safety? Yeah, yeah. all right, good-o. <laughs> No idea. Um, okay, so we have with us Alex Cara, Jim Yoshioka, Ross Murray, and Paul Diamond. I've asked them to just really briefly introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their work. Um, and Paul's got a bit of a presentation he's going to walk us through as well. So I'll start with you, Alex. Hello. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm Alex Cara. Um, I'm a printmaker, illustrator, comic maker, and also early childhood teacher for the most part at the moment. <laughs> um, I've self-published a comic book in 2017 called um, Dreams Appear Far From Home, which is all kind of like New Zealand settler stories, um, and that's probably been my main work. <laughs> Kia ora koutou, uh, I'm Jim Yoshioka. Um, I've been making comics for a good number of years now. Um, I think um, the work that I'm working on the most at the moment is an ongoing webcomic series called Circuits and Veins. Uh, but um, I think probably the work that's most relevant to this panel is um, a series I did exploring my mixed Japanese and New Zealand heritage uh, a few years ago. So it was very much personal stories exploring um, what this sort of mix of identity can mean. Um, yeah. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Ross Murray. I um, I had a graphic novel, my first graphic novel, published this year called Rufus Marigold, which was uh, inspired by my own um, personal experiences with uh, social anxiety and public speaking. So, um, <laughs> so apologies in advance if I'm completely incoherent and a utter train wreck, but. Um, I initially started making uh, a web comics, um, a strip called Pet Talk Records, um, another one called Strange Tales from Summer Bay, and uh, a couple more, and uh, and Ruf Rufus Marigold, which started out online, and um, yeah, this year um, found itself uh, into book form. Kia ora koutou. I'm um, Paul Diamond. I'm the Māori curator here at the Alexander Turnbull Library. Um, and it's kind of intimidating to be a s around people who can actually draw, but those who can't draw <laughs> write books and articles about people who can draw. Um, I got asked to do a, this book about um, Māori and cartoons, which turned out to be this book we launched like here last year called Savage to Suit. Um, and... I've had a really odd path to being the curator here. I started as an accountant, then became a journalist, and then got involved in oral history and writing, and then 
became the curator Māori here at the Turnbull in 2011. But the thing I didn't was a little bit shy about mentioning when we had to do those questions for the Wellington City Library was um, that I actually got slightly obsessed with Walt Disney comics when I was little and, you know, even went to the thing of collecting them and even spending ridiculous amounts of money when I only had a paper run as a source of income on comics. Um, and I'd kind of forgotten about that. So, you know, I just thought I'd share that in this. I thought this would be the one place in Wellington that'd be safe to say that. <laughs> Well, do you want to go through your images now, or are you doing that later? <laughs> Alrighty, I just thought as a way of um, just structuring some of the ideas of this book, and maybe it, it does help set up the conversation, because it was a, a big learning curve for me, because apart from um, that experience with Walt Disney Comics as a youngster, I guess I had grown up reading um, editorial cartoons as growing up here in Wellington in Lower Hutt, Neville Lodge, um, that people might remember in the Evening Post, which doesn't even exist anymore, Eric Heath in the, in the Dominion. Um, but one of the big ideas we found when we started looking at these cartoons was there's, there's a big change in representation of Māori. So this is just to give you an idea of the before sort of typical representation, which I think is to do with how... Pākehā saw Māori, and it kind of made me think about audiences, like did, did media owners ever think Māori read newspapers, you know, who were these cartoons actually aimed at, and I guess everything you're talking about, like graphic novels, comics, editorial cartoons, that's a question actually, or I mean some people may say I do this for myself, but, but often audience is relevant in terms of thinking, and that's kind of interesting and scary and exciting in, an, in a digital online environment. And it's also this image, I think, reflects this idea of how Pākehā wanted Māori to be or to become. And we had to find an image. When I was asked about an image for the cover, I selected this because I thought it sort of embodied um, a whole lot of interesting ideas. And also had some of what we call these signifiers. Look at the huia feather and the man in the centre. And started to notice that so many of those early cartoons of Māori had huia feathers that my former boss, Bromman Daly, who was a chief historian, who re read some of my chapters for me, she said it was no wonder the huia became extinct because all these cartoonists were grabbing feathers all the time. <laughs> oh, it would help if I turn this on. Here we go. Sorry. And then just another um, image of this sort of before representation. This is from 1894, before the tangi, after the tangi. So very much the sort of in the idea is that Māori need to change and their culture needs to change and that their customs like tangihanga are negative, full of all sorts of negative consequences for Māori and the sooner they sort of get rid of this and become more like Europeans, become Europeans, the sort of old Māori customs die out the better. So again, signifiers. So it was amazing how often Māori were always either barefooted or would often have one shoe on and, and one barefoot and ill-fitting clothing. So Melinda Johnston, who was here for the period I was working on this, was really helping me analyse images. And you'd think, you know, oh yeah, I can see what's going on in that image. But there's just, there is actually so much. And I don't think it's about overthinking it. I think it's just about being aware of what's in these, in, inside the frame. And these guys may, 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 may have different views, but I, I've sort of come to think that nothing in a frame is, is there by accident. There's, there's always a reason why the artist has placed the various, various elements. I mean, even in the book, you'll see I've written actually about that fence post, because I thought that was interesting when I thought about it, because that's a fence post that used to hold, what are they called? Strainers, the, the wires, but there aren't any strainers there, and it's sort of sending a message about, well, these people don't know how to look after their land. Look, they've got fence posts that don't even have any wire in them. So then just moving much later into the period that I really was looking at, which was from sort of the 1930s through to the 1990s, you see this is Māori and others um, getting ready to welcome the Queen in 1953. And we found an essay by someone who'd written about this because they remembered seeing this as a child and then they looked back at it and thought, well, hang on, there are no Māori in the crowd there apart from these two Māori who are helping the Prime Minister, Sid Holland, roll out the welcome, welcome mat. And it's kind of interesting that why Māori weren't represented as, as ordinary New Zealanders then. They've got these ceremonial roles, so yeah, they're barefooted, they've got pew pew, tipare, and they've got those huia feathers again in their hair. And I think it is interesting, I mean, and I know cartoonists have said to me that they struggle with, well, how do you represent Māori other than using these signifiers? 
But I think there are ways of doing it. And you can't get away from the fact that stereotyping still happens. I mean, you know, we still have the man on the desert island, the, the scientists that are represented by people with white coats. I mean, it's not necessarily that, that stereotyping is bad, it's just about how it's used. So then this is the shift. You see people like Tom Scott emerging as cartoonists who had, and Ian Grant who um, founded the Cartoon Archive which um, asked Turnbull for this book to be produced, has sort of said that there was this later generation of cartoonists who didn't necessarily agree with the views editorial line of their newspaper and had their own views. And but it's interesting, I mean, there's no huya feather there that I can see, but it's very much, you know, using some of that traditional iconography and, and imagery, but for quite a different sort of intent. And I would argue that there's an assumption there that, yeah, Māori might be reading this newspaper as well, that they're part of the conversation. I don't know that they were really envisaged as being part of the conversation in those earlier cartoons. And then there's a whole chapter in this book looking at how did Māori see things, and this is 1957, when the South African team toured New Zealand and beat the New Zealand Māori side by 37 to nil, and one of these spectators is saying, I think I'll take my name off the Māori roll. And, um, but I just found this fascinating how he'd managed to, Harry Dancy, sorry, is the artist who was also a race relations conciliator, how he'd managed to draw Māori without pew pew or tipare or huia feathers, and they probably got shoes on, uh, that we can't see that. The little figure on the right was um, Tiki, a little lepre Māori leprechaun, his family said he was a uh, little um, motif through all his cartoons. And just last, this is someone who's going to be in the next session, um, Sharon Murdoch's cartoon. Um, people can probably remember the dopey TVNZ Kiwi Meter quiz, which had that question, Māori should not receive special treatment, do you agree? And this character in the centre saying, absolutely, yes, I've had about all the special treatment I can stand. And she's got these labels, you know, early death, prison, poor health, land confiscation, poverty, substandard housing and lower educational outcomes there. And you know, I think that's clever because it's using some of those stereotypical elements, the association of Māori and violence and domestic violence and things, but using it for a very different intent. So I guess I haven't got answers, but I guess I'm, I, my big hope for this book would be as part of this whole process of just learning to read these things. And that still allows for individual interpretation because all of us will have a different interpretation of the six images I've just shown you. But I guess I learned in doing this book is that there are all sorts of... Um, ways of reading these and actually it, it makes it more interesting I, I think and I'm t incredibly excited that um, someone on the panel has been working with the Punch cartoons which um, the, there was a very early edition of Punch which is completely out there in Taranaki during the land wars and extraordinary imagery so um, I hope we get to hear a bit more about that that's enough from me, kia ora. Me too, thanks Paul, um, I think that's raised a lot of uh, questions around race and representation that I'm hoping we're going to circle back to a bit later on. Um, but I actually wanted to start with a question that Paul's already answered, which is, what did you read when you were growing up, <laughs> comics-wise? Um. Uh, I, I remember a lot of um, serialised Star Wars comics in the Women's Weekly. It's <laughs> a highlight for me. Um, Asterix books from the school library. I was utterly obsessed with Asterix, and um, rather, rather sadly, I, I still have frequent dreams about discovering new Asterix books I've never read in bookstores. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in terms of local um, comics and cartoons, I, I was a big fan of Terry T.O. Mm -hmm. Terry and the Gunrunners, and, uh, and Foot Rot Flats, of course. Um, when I was a bit older, um, I discovered the Dharma Punks uh, by Ant Sang, and got me reading some other Kiwi cartoonists, um, Carl Wills and Timothy Kidd. And um, Hicksville was a, a huge revelation for me. And then I uh, discovered... Um, the Fantagraphics artists, Dan Clowes and Charles Burns and Chris Ware, and uh, and they uh, they turned comics um, for me into something from something I wanted to read into uh, something I wanted to make. Um, yeah. 
Um, so I feel like I came to comics in a kind of roundabout way and that I was a child obsessed with drawing and obsessed with writing stories. Um, and so for me it was pretty much these two very separate things that I decided I wanted to work together to, um, to be able to use them um, together to tell stories. And the easiest and most efficient way to be able to do that is in comic book form um, because animation, you need a team of people. Um, picture books, which I probably still would like to do, often have a sort of um, like a very different length or different feel to them to, um, to the kinds of stories that I was engaging with and wanting to write. Um, in terms of actual material, um, yeah, again, lots of lots of Tintin and aesthetics when I was little, um, and that was really about it in terms of actual comic comics. There just wasn't a lot around um, at all to, to sort of find. I lived in Napier. Um, they were, you know, we could buy Simpsons comics, I think, at the local dairy, and that was about it. Um, and so it was whatever the library had, and, um, yeah, I was, I was very much into reading a lot of um, sort of children's fiction and, and novels and chapter books and that kind of stuff, and then coming home and watching all of my um, animation and cartoons and Pokemon and, you know, playing video games. Um, and so when um, we got the internet... Um, and I discovered web comics. That was a point where I realised that this was something that I could do. This was a format that I could take in order to make comics myself. And so, yeah. So from from a very early age, the sort of early teens, I was like, all right, well, let's put these two things together and make comics. Then. And that's been like that ever since. Um, I had I had quite an early start as well. I sort of, um, I remember I was reading, it was kind of before I could learn, before I'd learned to read, I was reading the really awful like 2000s versions of like the Beano and the Dandy and all those old English um, <laughs> comic papers, which were probably terrible, but they actually helped me learn to read just because of the ease of having the simple words and the pictures together. Um, and then I'd say I got, like huge exposure to heaps of different types of comics just through Christchurch City Libraries, mm -hmm. having so many different types or manga and European comics, like as Ross says, all the fantagraphics kind of stuff like Dan Klaus and all that. And that I think just reading so much at one time when I was about 15, just like consuming so many different types really made me want to make them myself. Oh, and sorry. <laughs> and um, in terms of New Zealand comics, I think it would have only really been Hicksville and Foot Rock Flats at that time that I'd kind of had exposure to. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a, a big question to leap into, but I wanted to know how much of the comics you make are about expressing your identity. I don't know if you can speak to such an obtuse, large question. And also maybe for Paul, you know, how much do you see that in editorial cartoons as well? I don't know if anyone wants to tackle the question of identity in cartoons and comics. Um, I guess I'll start since I did a bunch of autobio stuff, so that's kind of inevitably about me. Um, yeah, I mean, I never... When I, when I started making, um, started working on my autobio comics, um, I'd recently finished a bunch of other bits and pieces of things and I wasn't really sure what it is that I wanted to work on next. Um, and I was personally starting to explore um, the odd bit and piece of, um, of sort of like connecting back in with my Japanese heritage. Uh, so yeah, my grandmother is Japanese, but um, my father was born here and I've lived here my whole life as well. So it's always like the sort of quirky, extra, fun, flavorful thing that I get to say about myself. Um, but I um, wanted to really explore what that actually meant for me culturally um, within a New Zealand context. So um, the, the, sort of, the series started off uh, because I was getting ready to go to a friend's wedding um, and I decided that I was going to wear the kimono that my grandmother gave me for my graduation, um, which was the first time that I would have actually worn it to wear it somewhere other than just to put it on to see that, you know, to see if I could put it on. So I had a huge existential crisis <laughs> when I got it out of the, um, 
the um, drawer and realised that the last time I'd folded it to put it away, I hadn't done it quite right. And so it had some creases in it. And how do you get creases out of a very big, very heavy, very precious antique silk kimono? Um, there's not really another human being in the land that I would necessarily trust to do this for me. And I had no idea how it was that I could take on this problem myself. Uh, so I looked to the internet and the internet was like, oh, don't worry about it. Just fold it back up properly and put it under your other kimono. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, okay, this is my only kimono. <laughs> um, and I don't have time to wait and wear a different kimono to my friend's wedding. So... Um, so yeah, um, yeah, I ended up, um, you know, it just ended up balled up in this kind of on the floor in frustration and I took a picture of it um, just because I was feeling very angsty um, and then I realised that it was sort of shaped like a, a heart and so that started me off on this journey of sort of writing these sort of quite lyrical, poetic um, pieces exploring different elements of, of what I remember and the connections that I find um, back to this, um, back to Japan, and this sort of very personal connection for me, um, and that it's okay if it doesn't make sense to other people. Um, so yeah, so that was that was sort of has been quite a journey for me as I've personally been going on a journey to to sort of connect back in, um, yeah, and and work out exactly what the, it is that that's going to mean for me, um, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, and then the school journal asked me to do a piece last year based on all of that. So now all of New Zealand children get to read it <laughs> and get cute um, comments from teachers, which is really lovely. Um, I'd say, I'd say I keep coming back to several kind of things in my stuff. So that's obviously showing some obsession, but things like embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> and like um I think I I always seem to include like um people being obsessed with dreams and dreams being really important because they're important to me. And I'm one of those boring people that's sort of I need to tell you about what I dreamt about last night <laughs> and putting a lot of importance. Um I'd say also like I guess Englishness is just a big thing that's um so far, because of them being settler stories, I guess it's kind of like Englishness in another place. Um, yeah. I think, um, I think uh, comics are a, a really wonderful medium for um, expressing identity, I think. Um, because they feature both um, unique voices in the, in the form of narrative and dialogue um, and this very rich visual identity um, and, and those combining, um, they can form um, and convey quite a, a powerful kind of nuanced perspective. Um, and I think... Um, I think especially for uh, comics makers who both write and draw their own material, the, the, that autonomy is, uh, can be really crucial to, um, to creating a, a, a really pure expression of thought. Um, so I think, yeah, th they're a wonderful medium um, with which to explore some of those things. Um, I guess I've, I've done that a bit with... Um, some of my work, primarily with, with Rufus Marigold. Um, with that, I, I didn't want to tell a, a strictly um, autobiographical um, story. So, uh, yeah, I just found the, the, the form um, provided a lot of opportunity to, to, um, to mix very personal, but um, in kind of a slightly um, removed and, and surreal manner, um, if any of that made sense. <laughs> I guess I'm un interested in how cartoons and comics, I guess, reflect changes in society. And, and when I started working on this project, it became this book. 
um, my boss, the chief librarian here, said to me, well, so can I see, you know, can I pick an event in history that was important to Māori and see cartoons about it? And um, I found you can't, uh, because what was important to Māori wasn't necessarily what was important to editorial cartoonists who were pretty much all Pākehā. Uh, well, no, not completely. I mean, there were people like Harry Dancy in the 50s, but mostly you're talking about middle-class, middle-aged Pākehā men. And um, so, but, and he said to me, for example, the engineers haka in 1979, so it's 40 years since the um, engineers at Auckland University had an annual tradition of dressing up with literally grass skirts and they, um, they drew penises on themselves and swear words and, and wore their engineer's helmets and then did a mock haka. And in 1979, a group of Māori were unhappy about this and went to the rehearsal and beat them up quite violently. And it caused a huge controversy in New Zealand. There was a major inquiry into race relations in New Zealand as a result. And it was really contentious and fraught in the university environment because the student president said, well, the issue's not violence, the issue's racism. And it, the engineers were completely blindsided by this. And even Māori themselves weren't all opposed to what had happened. Uh, because the Minister of Police, being couched, said, well, a culture should be able to laugh at itself. So it's not as if all Māori agreed with the protesters who did that assault. But that, that I'm mentioning that haka because that's the pivot point that was the change that I showed you in those cartoons. That, that suddenly, around 1979, you stop seeing Māori culture being trivialised and, and ridiculed uh, and... I think that's really, really interesting. And when I've actually talked to some of those engineers, they said to me, oh, we'd go and do raids on, um, as a sort of a group of people doing the haka on these other um, groups. And I suddenly realised he was talking about what the savage clubs did. And there probably aren't people here who really have had any experience of those. But New Zealand, every town in New Zealand had a savage club. They were named after Mr Savage in England. And men would go along and dress up and as Māori or as savages, and then they would do these raids. It was sort of a social club, but they had rangatira and they, they had little toy patus and everything. And, but then they completely disappeared because it just wasn't okay to be running around in a pupu as a Pākehā and painting tattoos on your face and calling yourself a rangatira. It, it would, so it's that sort of shift. So I guess, you know, compared with the period I looked at, I think it's really exciting, the voices that are out there, and I think as a result of something Hannah did, I mean, is it Sam Orchard? Is that the name? of the artist who's done trans, some of those trans um, books and graphic novels, which I found. Yeah, we are beneficiaries. Yeah. Mm. I mean, it would. Yeah, well, I think it's interesting. I mean, it would be great. My hope would be that more work is being done to sort of, and also coming forward to the work these guys are doing, to sort of be looking at what is going on. You know, like the, it would be interesting to look again at images of women in cartoons. It would be interesting to look at um, queer gay people. It would be interesting to look at other ethnic groups in New Zealand. And I've been thinking a lot, and I don't have answers about stereotyping um, in the last few weeks, actually, given what's happened in this country and how, how that works. And, I mean, we all know that, that cartooning has been literally deadly for people overseas. So, yeah, I don't know answers, but I think just having a better idea of what's going on is, is a good start. I think that's a really interesting um, thing to think about, uh, Paul, and I think it's um, that cartoons have this real power to be um, both symbols of, um, of, um, an, of empathy as well as, simple, as, well as um, used to um, perpetuate... Um, sort of ideas of um, yeah, stereotypes or, um, or ignorance. And so I think that, um, that as illustrators and artists, we have a, a responsibility to, to be cr critical about the way that we are, um, we are um, viewing and interpreting our work um, and to look out from just beyond what, what it is that, that we represent out into a wider audience as well. I mean, a lot of my work's been very sort of focused on br bringing my own stories forward, but even within that, I'm very conscious of the other sort of edges of narrative that I'm sort of drawing on or pulling pulling around um, my webcomic, um, Circuits and Veins, which I've been working on for almost two years, 
is um, is very personal in terms of the fact that um, like I, I base the um, one of the characters has a chronic illness, which is something that I've experienced in my life. Um, the the you know the sort of um, a lot of the the sort of cultural elements I'm drawing on both New Zealand and um, and Japanese culture in order to tell that story. But I'm also making sure that I'm looking to be broader than just what I know about that, and that I'm continuing to research to improve what it is that I am pulling and drawing on that, and that um, is um, something that, that I think is, you know, hopefully we're moving in a good direction with, and, um, yeah, that's I uh, just wanted to add that in there. Yeah, I was kind of raised a question I was going to come to a bit later around kind of diversity and representation and are we doing enough, what more can we do? You know, I wonder if you, anyone had any anything to add to that... No pressure. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I think you've just got to um, make sure that what, whatever you draw is uh, a faithful um, reflection of the society we, we live amongst. Um, yeah, I think, yeah. Comics 10 years ago, 20 years ago probably just populated with a whole lot of white dudes but um you um yeah you, you see a lot more of um real people in comics today and i think that's uh it's got to be a positive thing i think it's also about um knowing knowing your history and that um you know there is a, like a rich history of of people other than just white dudes who <laughs> have been making comics for as long as they've been comics but it's um sometimes difficult to find them because we forget to write about them in the history books so um so that i think that's the challenge is, is realizing um that there is a there is a resurgence and a growth and a um and you know more voices being heard, and that's important. Um, but one person alone isn't diversity. <laughs> like you can't be diverse by yourself. And so even if it's um, yeah, so that's that's the thing is like how many different voices are we encouraging? It's it's not about just telling your own story. It's also about as a as an artist, how am I supporting other people to tell their stories? Because there are stories that don't belong to me, and that's fine. Um, how do I make sure that the people whose stories they do belong to are getting the space to tell those stories? Um, yeah, and th these aren't. This is not a zero sum game. It's not like there's, um, you know, there's only enough attention for a certain number of things. Um, you know, there's the the internet um, in some ways. Um, when when it's at its best, it means that we have like an almost infinite playing field that we can help to sort of um, support and cultivate these new voices. So, um, and they're not new voices actually, existing voices that have always been sharing their stories that um, now we can, you know, we can actually um, promote to a wider audience. I was um, curious to ask you three about um, how you see the future in terms of your work reaching your audiences, the people that you're interested in seeing it, because the project I've just finished was based on a way of um, images being disseminated that's largely a vanished world. So I mentioned I was a paper boy, so every Saturday morning I'd have to go around in Stokes Valley with my bike and get the money for the paper. Everybody subscribed to the paper in Stokes Valley they did and, they, and, um, and that was and everybody got you know they probably got both papers actually they might have got the Dominion and the, and the Evening Post both those papers had their own cartoonists so Neville Lodge I said in the Post Eric Heath in the morning paper that world has largely gone um, we've got fewer papers we've got fewer editorial cartoonists in the, in the book we kind of you know looked more broadly because I just got curious about images of Māori everywhere comics and graphic novels and, and other places but um, I'd be really curious for you guys, that is it, is it a sort of a, I mean, you mentioned the internet, I mean, the, also the other thing about that, that old world that I grew up in was that everybody read the same paper. So in Wellington, everybody, you know, had seen Neville Lodge's cartoon that, that the night before. It's not like that anymore. I mean, isn't it sort of, it's, it's so diffuse. But how do you guys see the future? I mean, you've all talked about publications, actually. So as sort of 
is pr print publication still going to be important for you guys? But how how do people engage with your work online? And also, you know, add in the question of you know how does that online audience affect the kind of work you want to make as well? Uh, well, despite uh, making web comics. Um, I still much prefer to read comics in material book form. Um, um, the internet as a platform is, is just a, a, a wonderfully easy way to make something and share it. I mean, if you make something and put it on the internet, someone's going to see it. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, I still love, I love books. And the comics I like, if it exists in book form, I will, I will find that and uh, and read it that way. Um, yeah, uh, what you were saying about, um, yeah, th they're not really being as much of a, a monoculture anymore. You know, all everyone's not reading one newspaper. People aren't sitting around in living rooms together watching. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. So everyone's uh, everyone's going down their own little rabbit holes, um, and I think in terms of um, creating work um, for people to see, I think um, if you make something honest um, and good uh, that people have a chance to connect with. Um, and put it out there. People, will, people will seek it out. People like to find their own things. I mean, the internet's great, great for that. But um, um, yeah, I've kind of lost my train of thought. <laughs> I pass this on. I'd um, I'd agree with Ross because I'm, I'm too, I'm so attached to books as objects as well. And just the idea of being able to make something and then publish it is sort of, that's a big thing for me. And I'm rubbish online. <laughs> I'm not good with the internet at all, but I can I can see the, as you say, it's just so easy to get stuff up there and to make it available for people. But I, I think I'm quite hopeful for the future of um, printed comics still because I think it's, there's sort of, um, you sort of, if 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 it's designed to be read in book form, I think it's still it's not really something you can translate online. So, and I think there's so many people who love to read comics as books that it will be there'll be an an, an audience even if it's niche. It's yeah. Yeah, um, I guess I'm probably the most web comicy of the folks here, um, but I do still absolutely think that there's a place for printed comics and printed work um, it's it's definitely a and it's not an or in terms of in terms of the structure of it um, I think we were talking in the children's um, the children's panel about child, the rise of children's comics and one of the really cool ways that kids can um, have access to them is via the library and that's only really going to work with printed comics um, you know the internet is not it, like as safe a place for children, so um, you know a, a book that you can see exactly what this, they're getting out of it is you know that's a much you know there's always going to be that that audience for that kind of a work um, within within web comics in terms of the finding an audience. Um, I feel like I've been very lucky with with my comic. Um, I upload it to um, Webtoon, which is a regular um, like platform that specialises just in sharing web comics. And so I so people go there knowing that they're going to get web comics. Um, they have a there's a vague sort of idea of what sort of comic styles they'll get from that, um, and then they they can find my work and and read it on a, on their phones as they would any other kind of of comic. Um, and I write, I do have actually changed how I write um, my comic because I'm writing in a serialised format for an online audience um, who are going to be scrolling through my work rather than reading it in a book. So I, I, when I first started my webcomic, I was like, well, eventually I'll print this. And so I, I wrote it as if it was a comic book. 
um, with the kinds of panels and layouts and, and special care that I would take if I was going to be publishing it as a graphic novel. And I think it was probably about six months ago, I was like, screw this. <laughs> this is so much work. I'm like, I might print this at one day, but it's already 300 pages long because um, this is how serialized web comics go. So I might as well just let myself like really work strongly with the format let myself have fun with these sort of like really big long sort of spaces of um of just like um of color and and volume and play with different size panels and all of these sorts of stuff and future gem can worry about turning it into a book <laughs> um so sorry future gem um, <laughs> um but yeah i think there's there's this really um really nice um sort of like um cohesive like balance and um and sort of symbiosis or like sort of joint uh, relationship between uh between web comics and online comics and the online environment around comics and printed comics like I don't think they're separate at all they're sort of two parts of the same cultural space um and you see this with the rise of um of kickstarter and like crowdfunded um editions of web comics as well so you know there's these um and also um like um, ind indie publishers or other publishers in the US picking up web comics after they've already been proven to be successful. Because what's best? What's is, like going to be better than like an already built-in audience for a product? So um, or you know a story. It's like you know that this is going to sell because it already has um, hundreds of thousands of people who are waiting to read it, um, and and ha and hold it in their hands and share it with their friends who don't like reading web comics and get it into that space. So I think there's. Um, that they work together, that they're sort of two parts of the same thing. And, um, yeah, even though they might have slightly different um, – you might stylize them slightly different because that's what's best for the format. They um, they definitely go together. All right. We're sort of over into question time, but I – audience question time. But I, I don't want to miss the chance to ask you – um, Alex, to talk a little bit about some of your work and um, particularly the inspiration. So you draw quite heavily on New Zealand documentary heritage, which is, you know, my my day job, um, and I'm really interested on in how notes from a captain's log and your other work came about. Um, well, I was I actually made um, notes from a captain's log, which is like a little kind of sort of like. Oh, I've got Se it. Sepia, yes. Oh, we've got it here, but it's just it's sort of a smaller one. But I did it very style-wise, very heavily inspired by um, uh, Taranaki Punch, mm. as, um, uh, which was <laughs> sort of like like a localized version of the English Punch comic. It's a magazine, all done by one guy. <laughs> so I had a bit the feeling of an obsessive project. So it was just this one guy churning it out and doing all the woodcuts and doing all the text and things it's very like crude and the content's very crude <laughs> and you know quite <laughs> intense um so i was just because that was like a built-in piece of um new zealand comics history i felt like i i had to do something with that so style wise i sort of used that and then um the story is um drawn a bit from an ancestor of mine. So I had a, a Captain Bob McCrone, <laughs> who was a uh, uh, not not quite the same situation, but anyway, he was a he was a captain. But so it's set on a a boat, bringing people over from England to New Zealand, and it's like documenting a voyage. Mm. Yeah. All right, I've got so many other questions I wanted to ask, but I might just hand things over to the audience. So do we have any questions? And please. Please wait for a mic before you ask, because we're recording. Sorry, I seem to have a question about every session. <laughs> um, yes, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm just wondering, like a, like a New Zealand movie, and when we have a comic or in this industry, you create something with a New Zealand f unique New Zealand flavor or say cultural authenticity. Um, do you find it actually limiting or because if you want to appeal to the international audience or readership and or do you think you 
you just uh, sort of consciously make some kind of decision, do I want it to be universal and not too much of a New Zealand unique thing or um, how did you find a balance and uh, did you find it limiting or advent it's an advantage? Um, I think I think for the couple of books that I've done, it was I really had a New Zealand audience in mind, so it wasn't so much a question of will this will this not be applicable to anyone outside of New Zealand? It was sort of like it was made with a New Zealand audience in mind, and I think just generally I'm not very good at thinking about um, what's going to make my work universally appealing. I think I'm a bit like self-interested <laughs> and only keen on making things that really interest me. <laughs> so it's sort of like, um, if I can make something I'm really happy with, that's sort of, you know, using all my interests and stuff, then it's, I'm pleased with it. Um, but I'm really pleased with the response I've had just from the few things I've done. It's been lovely. Uh, I think, um it's it's difficult to get away from how New Zealand my work is um, just because that's where I live. It's the sort of cultural environment that I swim in. So even if I was trying to write something that was more general, the Kiwiness would still seep in there. <laughs> I don't think it's necessarily something that I could iron out or remove or, um, you know, or Americanize or, um, you know, globalize in any way. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't want to. Like, I'm. I think that one of the things that makes um, makes anyone's work strong is by by drawing on the truths that they see in the world around them. And I think there's a lot that's valuable about the way that we, as New Zealanders, are and live. That that um, are you know, it's 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 interesting and and it's relevant. And so I'd think that um, that you know, I'm a New Zealand author. I don't think I can ever. You know, I don't wouldn't ever want to be seen as in any other light. Um, so yeah, that's a part of what you get when you get me. Um, I don't feel like my work has a overly New Zealand flavour to it. Uh, my last book um, was kind of uh, it centred around the the brain of the protagonist, so everything else was kind of peripheral. But um, I am of the mind that. Um, um, omitting um, details that might only make sense to a local audience um, is a mistake. I think when you create fiction, there is a temptation to generalize, uh, to um, broaden the chances of accessibility. But um, when I think about the art that I love, um, so much of it involves real um, specificity of detail. Um, so even if I'm reading um, about a, a culture or, or something I'm completely unfamiliar with, um, if it's described in great detail, um, um, you get a real authenticity with that. And I think if something's, the more authentic something is, um, the, the more um, you can empathize with it. Next question. Yeah, all right. Now I've lost my list of questions. Who'd it go? We might have one oh. more one more up here, I think. With this gentleman. <laughs> uh, hello. Um, I was just wondering if um, if you could tell us about any future projects you're working on um, that that would be interesting. Uh, nothing concrete uh, just yet, but um, uh, yeah, I, I think I would like to um, explore more of a depiction of New Zealand in my work. Um, I, I grew up rurally and I've spent a lot of time in um, a small town, a small town, uh, coastal New Zealand, and uh, I'd really love to set something in that environment. I find that really interesting to play with. Um, uh, perhaps some short story comics. Um, 
Yeah, who knows, really? <laughs> Watch this face. So I will probably be wrapping up my 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 sort of main web comic at some point in the next six months to a year, depending on. But um, after that, I'm planning on writing as I'm working on already sort of in development a story based on, I guess a lot of like traditional Japanese folklore is the easiest way to describe it. So looking at a lot of the um, the sort of like ghost stories and like like local monster stories and kind of like folk tales that um, that are really common in Japan and trying to sort of distill some of that down um, into some kind of ridiculous epic adventure saga and uh, incredible take me 10 years to finish thing. <laughs> <laughs> we, we want more Kitsune. We need to have more, more Ellen. Um, I was, at the moment, I'm working on just putting together like an art book, so just with some yeah, sketches and... So rather than comics, just more sketches and different types of art that I've done just over the past couple of years. Um, I was also looking at, I was also wanting to do maybe um, looking at Instagram as a, sounds very millennial, but Instagram as a, um, a platform for doing comics. So sort of maybe just short, short things and that you can sort of, you know, scroll through and get, yeah, just looking at that. Do you want to talk about your next project, Paul? Well, s next up is something here that's not, no, I don't think there is a comics graphic element to it, but an uh, exhibition here called Pukana about Māori performance, which opens here in September. Um, and then after that, assuming that all goes all right, I'm allowed to go and I'm going to be in Berlin um, from November for 11 months working on a book about Charles Mackey, a New Zealand former mayor of Whanganui who was killed in Berlin in 1929. And... Um, I've been really interested in that period, the Weimar period, and, and Babylon Berlin, which was on television, was based on a novel called Der Nasser Fisch, but that was, before it became the film, was um, a graphic novel. And there's actually a couple of graphic novels about that whole period, and particularly the riots that this man from Wanganui died in. So oh, I'm quite excited about the idea of maybe of a visual, a graphic novel version of Wanganui in the early 1900s and then Berlin in the late 20s. But I've got to write the book. Well, I should really <laughs> pull my finger out and write the book. So that's, yeah, that's what's ahead of me. All right. We are over time. So can you just join me in thanking Alex, Jim, Ross and Paul? <laughs>